16th century angel magic sources. Today, we're delving into the 1517 De Arte Kabbalistica of Johann Reuchlin. And I'm going to give a link. And today, we're actually delving into some of these texts that were written in Latin in the 16th century about shim angels and shim angel magic. Okay, so today, once again, we're reading De Arte Kabbalistica by Johann Reuchlin, and I'm going to provide a link uh, for those that want to buy a copy. And by the way, this is an excellent English translation, um, and I'm just reading a small excerpt of this is all. I'm going to read a small excerpt with a link to buy, and this wonderful translation is by Martin and Sarah Goodman. Introduction to the Bison Book Edition by Moishe Edel. Okay, so on the Art of the Kabbalah by Johann Reuchlin. And this actually includes the, um, the Psalm verses for the Shem Angels. So a lot of you would be actually pretty interested if you have a copy. Really, if you want to work with the 72 Shem Angels, uh, for magic and you want to have like historical text then there's really just two books from this 16th century there's Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy Agri Agrippa's three books and then there's uh, Johann Reuchlin's De Arte Kabbalistica by the way out of respect um, for um, Jewish Kabbalah it should be pointed out for completeness of the subjects that Johann Reuchlin, who wrote this, this was actually a Christianizing influence. So even though it's spelled with a K here in this text, uh, which normally refers to Jewish Kabbalah, I just wanted to point out that Johann Reuchlin was actually a Christian that had a deep interest and in reverence, though, for Jewish mysticism. And he was one of the earliest, along with Pico della Mirandola, to... Uh, of Gentiles to study the Kabbalah and elucidate. But anyways, like I said on page 277 here, you have the 72 Shem Angels and the Psalm Verse attributions. So this is these are the Psalm Verse attributions for the Shem Angels in fifth, published in 1517 in the six, early 16th century, which are most of them are copied by Athanasius Kircher in the 17th century and then later. So, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave a, leave a link for those that um, would like to buy a copy. Once again, we are reading an excerpt from De Arte Kabbalistica. This, is a six, this was published in 1517. Um, so, this is uh, from the 16th century. So, I'm going to go ahead and go to book three. This is page 261. So once again, um, I like to study. I'm studying anyways. Why, you know, I love to go through these texts again and again. So why not do it with the viewer and we can do this together? You know, maybe others will get something out of this. And uh, once again, I'm going to leave a, a Amazon link if anyone wants to purchase the book. So this is a, a 16th century text. It's got info on the Shem Angels. So we're going to start reading on page 261. Once again, this is uh, 16th century angel magic, or it, it talks about the 72 Shem angels at least. So here we go. Page 261, the third paragraph. It begins if we pay attention. Here we go. So this is uh, Johann Reuchlin in the 16th century, to page 261. If we pay attention and add this alphabet of 22 letters in Hebrew to the 50 gates, we find the happy ranks of the seventy-two angels, by whom it is said, to, by whom it is said, to stand Shemhameferesh, that is the great interpretive name of the high God. For fifty and twenty-two make seventy-two. These are the angels strong over the whole earth. Through them it is thought did Moses the miracle worker divide the sea. <laughs> Through them, it is thought, did Moses the miracle worker divide the sea. By the way, that is part of the Shem angel lore, is that they were part, they like, and act, actually, the names of the 72 Shem angels are Kabbalistically extracted 
from Exodus or Shemot chapter 14 verses 19 through 21, which describes the parting of the sea. But anyways, um, these are the angels strong over the whole earth. Through them it is thought did Moses the miracle worker divide the sea with his hand down to the seabed. For these are the angels of division. And God divided the earth according to it the number of angels for the 72 nations and tongues. In the book, of, in the book Gates of Justice, the famous master of Kabbalah, Rabbi Yosef ben Karnatal wrote, quote, And all the nations were left, given into the power of the seventy rulers, unquote. That is, the dominion of the angels to whom the distinguished Kabbalist Rakanat assigns, written on, writing on Genesis chapter 48, the seventy palms that are round the twelve fountains which you know. It is clear that there, are, that there were two pillars, a pillar of fire and a pillar of, of uh, cloud. Once again, we're talking about Moses and the wilderness with the angel of the presence and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. This goes into the, the Shem angel lore, okay? So, back to this. Um, the 70 palms that are around the 12 fountains, which you know, it is clear that there were two pillars, two pillars of cloud and of fire on which were set two angels. So it is not an empty belief that in Moses' dividing the sea and setting free the children of Israel, the seventy angels of the world and the two angels of the pillars of fire and of cloud undertook the work of salvation, something which clearly comes to us from the ineffable tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, the tetragrammaton name, through the seventy-two names, which once this verse from chapter 14 of Exodus has been explained, are called from the Holy Scripture, quote, and the angel raised himself and went to the end, unquote. In the passage, quote, and the water was divided. So this is the parting of the Red Sea. The water was divided, unquote. These hallowed signs are in the present day stored in memories, and by these symbols the angels are summoned and bring help to men, to the praise and glory of the ineffable God. According to Gerundensis, in the introduction to Genesis, Rabbi Solomon wrote in his exposition of the Talmud that these are the shapes of the symbols. I am tracing them with my finger. And then here it follows the, the 72-fold name, which by adding El or Yah, you get the 72 names of the 72 Shem angels. Alex says hi. Hello, Alex. Shout out to Alex. Thank you for catching me live here. Okay, I just did a shout out. Here we go. All these names spring from the quality of forbearance. And look, it, it has it right here. You know, by adding El or Yah, you get Vehuya, you know, Sitael, Elamya. Anyways, so these are the Shem Angels that we are working with in these videos. It's right here in 1517, De Arte Kabbalistica. Roikland's talking about it. Roikland's mentioning the same psalm verse most of the time that we talk about in these videos. So, 16th century angel magic, which can people never stop. People still working with it today. All these names spring from the quality for of forbearance, say the Kabbalists. This forbearance comes from the ten numerations, or sephirot. I will outline the tree of the numerations, or sephirot, please God, if you are ready to listen. Now, the, the setting of Johann Reuchlin's De Arte Kabbalistica is a type of dialogue, which reminds one kind of a, of a Socratic dialogue. So, uh, Philolaus and Maranus are speaking with, uh, they're speaking with the Rabbi Shimon. Okay, so anyways, Philolaus and Maranus. Of course we are ready. It was for this that we risked all the perils of the journey and incurred such vast and recurrent expense. Proceed. Let us learn something of these angels. Maranus, I've never heard their names. Uh, and I believe it is the same with you, Philolaus. Philolaus, that's right. Never have I seen these angels or known their names. Excellent, sir. We shall be extremely grateful if you go on and never stop. By the way, 
um, in this quote-unquote dialogue, these are a couple of Gentiles that are studying with a Jew, the Kabbalah. So even though Johann Reuchlin um, was technically a Christian, and probably an occultist, uh, he was a Christian, he was writing the, about the Kabbalah, still there, it, it is um, admirable that in this period, in the 16th century, relations between Gentiles and Jews were not always very favorable. So I just think that it's cool historically that, you know, he was writing so positively and people at the time were thinking positively of like learning wisdom from a rabbi in the 16th century. So it's just pretty cool. And then so Agrippa and then Johann Reuchlin, these two 16th century sources and then Athanasius Kircher in the uh, 17th century these would influence magicians people work in angel renaissance angel magic over the centuries and even today so instead of in my videos in, instead of just reading some modern angel magic book we actually work through the source material and we understand how angel magic evolved and the modus operandi of ceremonial magic over time so back to this Simon the rabbi says we can learn from the Holy Scriptures that there were many angels assisting in Moses's great and wonderful work when he divided the waters of the sea now where is this coming from there is definitely an influence of uh, Jewish Kabbalah with the 72 fold names and all that but um, but where is all of this coming from? Well, anyways, that's up for debate. But we see in De Arte Kabbalistica, it's talking about this with the 72 Shem angels. These are the divine. Um, we can learn from the Holy Scriptures that there were many angels assisting in Moses' great and wonderful work when he divided the waters of the Red Sea that the Israelites might cross dry shod. I do not want to be thought too clever. These are the divine words from Scripture, quote, And the angel of angels went, unquote. And not as the Latin translation runs, and the angel of the Lord raising himself. Here there is no Adonai, for which you can write Lord. It says Elohim, for which you usually read angels, as you have made him a little less than the angels. And in the side of angels will I him thee. But here angel is not written as it is elsewhere Elohim. It should be borne in mind that Elohim here has the definite article Ha, prefixed as if the meaning of the sacred verse is understand by this angel of the cloud preceding the camp that there were many other angels also present the rulers of this world unquote um, by the way i just wanted to point out that some of this reading might seem dry to a lot of people but it's definitely rewarding even though yeah reading 16th century you know Kabbalah book on, you know, it, it it's rewarding to, you know, I, I recommend that people do go ahead and read through this material here. Um, and of course, we're talking about magic and, and, and angel magic and, you know, astral projection, all these things in my videos. I always encourage people, don't believe, just try it out come to your own conclusions, you know, people that believe in this stuff and they practice, and I do practice this stuff, by the way, I do, but I want people to draw their own conclusions, okay? Do you believe that this stuff is objectively real or no? Either way, it's an interesting study. But uh, back to this. So we're reading Johann Reuchlin again. Uh, these are the divine words from Scripture. Okay, let's see here. Okay, Talmud concurs in Me Mechilta Rabbi Nathan seeks an answer to this question from Shimon ben Yochai, a member of my family. Why, I ask, is it that everywhere else Angel of Adonai is written, while here it is Angel of Ha Elohim? The reply is the term Elohim is only used to indicate a judge or ruler. 
Thus the angel of the smoke is understood to have been the pre present together with the seventy governors of their area. Should it be angel of the smoke? And translated from the Latin, or is that supposed to be angel of the pillar of cloud? Smoke? I don't think it was smoke. Anyways, and he is called therefore Malak Ha Elohim, angel of the governors. Thus one would be right in counting 72. You have, because you have the 70 angels plus the angel of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, which makes 72. You have just seen me write out their signs, if you want rather, because you want, for I know that you want. I shall show you how they are derived from these sacred letters. Sound like something from a soul album. All right, going on to the next page. Take the three verses beginning, Vayisa, Vayabo, Vayet. And so what this is talking about here is how Kabbalistically, if you look at the Hebrew of chapter 14 of Exodus, that is Exodus chapter 14 or Shemot 14, verses 19, 20, and 21 each have 72 Hebrew letters. And by putting these three Bible verses on top of each other and reversing this, flipping the second verse around, so it's reading left to right, like we normally do in English, Putting these on, you get 72 columns, you get the 72-fold name of God, which it is about to explain and which Agrippa explains in the three books of occult philosophy. So, anyways, I'm just explaining that, and now it's going to say the same thing. Take the three verses beginning Vayisa, Vayabo, and Vayet, and write them out one by one in a vertical column in the Kabbalistic manner, from right to left such that the letters of each word follow on one from another, from top to bottom, without a break. Then take the first letter of the first verse, which is called Vav. Next, working the, the other way, take the last letter of the second verse, like I said, the second verse is flipped around. Um, then you will get the, then you will, um, hey, and lastly go, to the beginning of the third verse, and you'll find the letter Vav again. So you get the, and by adding Yah, you get Vehuya, the first Shem angel. It's literally drawn from Exodus 14. Um, when you link up these three letters in this order, the first angel's mnemonic, Vav He Vav, or Vehuya, is obtained. The second angel, um, Yod He Yod, and the third is um, Samek Yod Tet, I think, Sitael. So too with the rest, whenever they are set out three by three, with the three columns kept properly straight and tidy, some sort of sign that explains that the tetragrammaton will be produced. And also by, um, if you put yod he if you put yod he vav he the tetragrammaton inside of a tetractus so you have yod plus yod he plus yod he vav plus yod he vav he you get 72 in gematria um um well look and uh well look consider and contemplate this well for this is the greatest happiness the greatest joy surpassing all joy in this age to remember god's holy commands the divine features called malachim in hebrew angels in greek and gods in latin and to occupy hand and brain in things so faultless, good, and hallowed, to keep close company with those shining white shapes whose splendor gleams only for the sharp-sighted eyes of noble minds, to be among the guests and confidants of the blessed spirits which care more for us than mortals, as brothers or sisters, and not just care but even love, even the walls seem to exult and rejoice with us that God's goodness has given us these alphabetical constructions, these signs of alphabetical, that God has given us these alphabetical constructions that we're talking about, alphabetical constructions, these signs of human weakness through which we are admitted to the happy bands of angels, given the limits of human ability. With the angels we rejoice and delight, 
our hearts at rest, worshipping and reverencing them. We pay them the honor due to such sublimity, those by whom we are loved, taught, and guarded. Marana says, I see the letters, but do not know what they sound like, and so do not know how to utter these words and invoke the angels. Now, this is important. I've heard people like, you know, in the angel magic community, people that actually want to work this stuff and try it out, they're like, well, I don't know how to pronounce it. And you have to know how to pronounce. In this, in the 16th century, Johann Reuchlin addresses that here because he says here, but I don't know how to properly pronounce it. So that's what he says. I see the letters, but I don't know what they sound like. And so do not know how to utter the words and invoke the angels. Now, what Simon says here, he says it really doesn't matter if you know how to properly pronounce, because the angels know you're talking to them, which makes sense. So, so uh, he says, as the eyes see the letters, so do the ears hear them. And as they see us, so do they hear us calling. I will tell you in two words how this comes about, in spirit and in truth. So he's saying, don't worry so much about pronunciation. Like, what a banal thing to worry about. Anyways, as our minds have tongues, so angels have ears. And just as divine spirits speak with the tongues of angels, so do human spirits listen with the ears of the mind. They do not give themselves names through any wish for acknowledgement or acclaim therefore. They are jogging the memory, wanting us to bear them in mind. So they give us these names to help to jog our memory of them. They're to help us. There are constructions to help us here. Do not think, because otherwise we're, we're missing the point here. Do not think that all the strength of the divine is found in speech. Do not think that all of the strength of the divine is found in speech. These symbols urge that we continually remember the angels. Making a practice of doing so brings us into the love of God. And in turn, love brings remembrance. We often remember what we greatly love. As it says in the proverb, lovers remember everything. Lovers, lovers remember everything. Love brings remembrance. God has not given us this name of the Tetragrammaton that we should call out what is unutterable. You are right to call it Anekphoneton, that is unpronounceable. You're right to say it's unpronounced. You're right. Uh, you're right to call it Anekphoneton, that is unpronounceable. To Moses' question, what is your name? The Creator replied, Yodhe Vavhe, my name to eternity, and that is my memorial from generation to generation. The name, by the way, Yahweh and Echie, I am, all these have to do with the verb to be, representing existence. So, Yahweh, Echie, Yehi, to be, um, and, uh, you know, Echie, I am. Echie Asher Echie, I am that which I am. So, all of these things, it's interesting that Tetragrammaton, Yud, He, Vav, he, these four Hebrew letters, rearranging them, it's just all different aspects of being. So, God doesn't say, my name's Bob or Fred or, you know, Shamantha, no. My name's being, existence. So, I'm just pointing out that it's very easy to laugh at the ancients when... Really, there may be a little bit more beneath the obvious surface that we need to look at and give the ancients a little bit of credit here, uh, where credit is due. But, back to this. Um, you are right to call it anekphoneton, that is, unpronounceable. To Moses' question, what is your name? The Creator replied, Yahweh is my name to eternity. It is my memorial from generation to generation. In other words, being the the tetragrammaton then is a name for eternity but for a generation it is only a memorial as no human word can encompass the name which equals the divine nature in which like existence comes out of we know the angels from their works and we have names for them for their individual works that represent the force of the angel. Uh, Raphael from medicine, because Raph is like healing. Raphael, 
from medicine, Gabriel from manliness, because Gab is like Gabra, Gabra, Gab is strength, Gabriel, strength of God. Mikael from wonder and all, from Hebrew, Mikael, who is like God. Um, so in other words, it's saying the names of an God is beyond any one force. So it's beyond all, although angels, it can refer to the quality or attribute. Okay. So we know the angels from their works and we have names for the, it's, it's great that we're, I mean, we're learning Kabbalah from a 16th century text. Anyways, um, we know the angels from their works and we have names for them from their individual works. Raphael from medicine, Gavriel from manliness, Mikael from wonder and awe. We interpret Mikael as who is so strong. Being mortals, we are too weak to discover their proper names, as we do not know their real nature, nor could we use the names if we even discovered them, except if it were by concession of divine revelation. And so a few scholars of insight set themselves to form the names of the angels from the numbers and figures handed down of the divine. They were like boys taught to derive sounds from letter, whether Greek, Roman, Arabic, or Egyptian, not because the sound to be voiced lacked letters, but because of our, imper our imperfections. So there are names and signs that either by their shape or their sound arouse our senses. The senses simulate the imagination, imagination memory, memory reason, reason understanding, understanding arouses the mind, and mind the angel. Your distinguished philosopher Maximus of Tyre wrote something on these lines very neatly in section 8 of Discourse of My First Visit to Rome. Thus this conjectural inference becomes clear to you. It is enough that you read the words, the three words which I have just resolved into the seventy-two names of the angels, the seventy-two names of the angels, with reverence and veneration, in the order that the Holy Spirit laid down, and that you press on directly through the love of them, in the names of God Most High, and burning ardor and fearful adoration, taking great care to bear in mind, that just as the number seventy-two is derived arithmetically from the numerical value of tetragrammaton, so the seventy-two angels are produced from the sign of the Creator, as if by divine issue. Any Hebrew letter you take stands for a particular number, gematria. Thus, in this way, yod he vav he equals seventy-two, by putting it like in a tetractus. Yod means ten, he five, vow six, he five again. Put together arithmetically, yod is ten, yod he fifteen, yod he vav is twenty one, and yod he vav he twenty six. Now add ten, fifteen, twenty one, and twenty six, and the answer is seventy two. Consider these, and, and people have actually been pondering the tetractus as a numerical device like you learn about this in math class and like it goes back to the ancient Greeks and all this and no tell you know Babylonia anyway any Hebrew le okay um consider these and you will understand clearly the need for the voice of the spirit to invoke spirits not shouting as the priests of Baal thought to whom the prophet Elijah says in 3 Kings 18 shout louder Perhaps your God is hiding or traveling or asleep and you must wake him, unquote. If we use speech for prayer, let us not try to move God and the angels with syllables and sentences as we would with mortals. Rather, let us summon our powers of desire for them and trust in them. So by our desire and our trust and our faith, we are a proper vessel to manifest the angel as opposed to like trying to use word formulas. Um, rather, let us summon our powers of desire for them and trust in them as in an anchor, as sailors bringing a ship into the port, throwing out cable or rope and pulling land toward them, such that though the land does not budge, their own efforts drag them to the land. 
So even though the angels aren't budging, we're technically pulling ourselves. So following this analogy, you're not pulling the land closer to you. You're trying, when you throw your anchor or whatever, and you're pulling the ship into shore, you're not pulling the, the, the island, you're pulling, but through trying to do that, you're actually bringing yourself. So through your own trust, through your own devotion, through your own divine love that is enkindled as a divine flame, through that, you can have a interaction, perhaps, according to this with, you know, divine, you know, with the angels. So, rather let us summon our powers of desire for them and trust in them as in an anchor, as sailors bringing a ship into port, throwing out cable or rope and pulling land toward them, such that though the land does not budge, their own efforts drag them to the land. We, in the same way, seem by sensible signs or letters um, or whatever, by some kind of preordained rule to drag ourselves towards the invisible divinity. On this hidden foundation rest all the sacred rites and ceremonies. It is because of this that we employ signs, letters, and phrases, the hymns and canticles, drums and choirs, stringed instruments, cymbals, organs, and other musical instruments, not so that we may soften up God, as we would a woman, and not so as to catch the angels with our sweet words in terms of endearment, we do it so that in the exaltation of God, in, in the divine state enacted in the, in the exaltation of God and the divine, we may acknowledge the poverty of our own condition and humbly confess our subordinate and obedient state and so unite all human desires in matters divine. In this way we conceive for the highest and intense and burning love, one which renders us able to give thanks more than anything else. So we stand with outstretched hands and arms. So we bend the knee, standing to pray. So we have been commanded to, to cut open a three-year-old cow and three-year-old goat, a, a turtle dove and a dove, to burn on the fire of ram caught in a thicket, after killing it with a sword uh, between the horns. So we put the letters Tate over the doors of our houses. It's talking about all these external aspects of religion, okay? The external aspects of religion, you know? A turtle dove and a dove to burn on the fire of ram caught in a thicket after killing it with a sword between the horns. So we put the letters Tau over the doors of our houses. So we look with respect on the brazen serpent and make the carabim and, and these images of angels and, and other such images. It's all, it's to focus, you know. We, we use set forms for speech and oath swearing. We build sanctuaries and gaze in awe on the priest clothed in various and wonderful garments. It's interesting. This was everything I'm reading. This was all written in the 16th century. Okay. This is the 1500s. Okay. 1500s. I've got books over there from the Middle Ages that go into uh, some of the psychology. Of but anyways, we're going to stick to that. Anyway, we're going to go deeper into these topics here. All these things and all things like them are made for us, intended to move us and to excite us to turn us away from the visible and towards the invisible. They are designed to increase our faith and strengthen our hope to transform true love of each other, which is most pleasing to God by diligent recapitulation into love of the divine. This teaching is wholly Kabbalistic. As in Book 3 of The Guide to the Perplexed, Maimonides says, it is intended that the ceremonies serve to remind us frequently of the fear and love of God and of obedience to his commands and to make us believe in God most high, which all men need. We are weighed down under the burden of the great mass of the body. 
We are much in need of means by which to rouse our sleepy minds. It is like a noble horse exhausted by a long journey that stands strong and upright when the trumpet sounds. It forgets how to stand still and pricks up its ears, or like a slow and stolid elephant whose courage is roused at the sight of fire. Our strength is worn away in secular matters, and we need the external physical stimuli of sound and ritual and sight to fortify our minds before they can apply themselves to spiritual work and carry out contemplation to the sublime with energy equal to our previous dumbstruck lethargy. The angels have been good to us in such a use of images, and have often found and introduced to us mortals figures, letters, forms, and phrases, which before were unknown and incomprehensible to us, and which in no way conform to the normal use of language. They were designed to lead us from the admiration of reason to continual investigation, and thence to the worship and lore of the intelligible. They have significance not in man's rules or whims, but in accordance with the will of God. Count Mirandola, note, he's talking about Pico de la Mirandola. Count Mirandola, an outstanding contemporary and religionist of yours, has transmitted all this to you from us. In his 900 conclusions, he says, it's, it's cool to read like, renaissance books like influencing each other. anyway all this to you from us in his 900 conclusions he says quote meaningless sounds have more magical power than meaningful ones any sound is good for magic in so far as it is formed from the word of god because its nature works magic primarily through the word of god unquote philolaus we men are fast asleep, and utterances of this kind would awake us more if they affected several senses, and not just one. So, in start engaging more senses than just one sense, hearing, then not only would their shapes and letters be apparent to the sight, but they would also strike our ears at the same time with distinct and separate towns, so that the letters could also have tones, as an example. So, if possible, I very much hope not just to see the names drawn, but also to hear them aloud. Simon, only idiots need a push from without. If you will excuse my saying so, such people are pretty dim. We are, though, born unequal, and different things always affect different people in different ways. Marnus, I agree, learned Simon. You speak the truth. Our teachers assert this true, that angels appear to men in different ways, depending on the state and nature of the person seeing or looking. Interesting. Um, Chrysostom, in his commentary on Matthew, writing in his usual verbose style, has these words to say on the subject about Joseph. Quote, the angel appears in a dream. Why not openly as to the shepherds and Zechariah and the virgin? because that man was a strong believer and had no need of vision." Unquote. Simon, you are right. The Kabbalists feel just the same and say that Abraham's strength of seeing was stronger than Lot's. Therefore, Abraham had an apparition of men only, but angels came to Lot. So they're seeing different things, but they're still reaching a reality. That's what Roykland's saying. Even though they may experience different things, they're reaching the same thing. Therefore, uh, the Kabbalists feel just the same and say that Abraham's strength of seeing was stronger than Lot's. Therefore, Abraham had an apparition of men only, but angels came to Lot. But I will perhaps say more of this elsewhere. And by the way, thank you all of you for joining in. There's a little bit more but we actually don't have much further to go and we'll complete this reading and um, yeah, pretty cool stuff. I love, I love this like classical Renaissance stuff. Anyways, uh, all right, where was I? Uh, 
<laughs> okay, Simon, you are right. The Kabbalists feel just the same and say that Abraham's strength of seeing was stronger than Lot's. Therefore, Abraham had an apparition of men only, but angels came to Lot. But I will perhaps say more of this elsewhere. Now, for a subject of importance to our case, there is, as you know, great diversity among human beings. Some have been quite happy and content just to have seen angels in human form. Others have seen them in the form of fire or wind and air at streams and waters. Some have seen angels in birds, gems, stones, minerals, precious stones. Interesting and prophetic frenzy through a spirit living inside them, and the shape of letters, or the sound of a voice, and so on. Holy Scripture, so you might see an angel in a, you know, a lightning, or, or, or in a sound, or, or in the striking of a bell, you know, in different ways, you know, you may have an apparition of the spirits, or, or the forms, they appear in different ways, okay? So we need to not be overly, like, literalistic in these types of things. Um, so, Holy Scripture contains many kinds of vision. But since these letters of the 70 names do not seem to satisfy you, I will show you, not only in the characters already, um, not only, I will show you not only in the characters already mentioned, but also in some to be mentioned shortly, how one may pronounce whatever is pronounceable from the shapes of the letters. We have it that God himself was the inventor of this skill, for we read in Exodus 23, quote, Behold, I send my angel before you to guard you on the way and to lead you to the place that I have appointed. Be careful in this in his sight and heed his voice, lest you annoy him. He will not pardon your crimes, for my name is in him. Unquote. By this we understand that properly the name of an angel ought sometimes to include the name of God. So when the masters of Kabbalah could not derive meaning from the name of any angel, they used the whole of a name of God and formed the angel's name from it. They saw that it was an improper use of the letters Mik or Gabri or Rafa to signify by them the name of an angel without the addition of the name of God El. So, Mikael, Gabriel, Raphael, resulting in Mikael, Gabriel, Raphael. So, it's all referring back to the same one reality, although it's a diversity of forces. Just like when light shining through, you get diversity of colors, they all refer back to the L, the same reality, but with a different attribute or focus of that one thing. When it came to the other angelic names, they tried to imitate sacred scripture and say Raziel, Yophiel, Sadkiel, Peliel, Maltiel, Uriel, and others like that. The Romans call their god on the capital best and greatest, being best because of his kindnesses and greatest because of his strength. Cicero bears this out in his speech to the priests on behalf of his own home. In the same way, the Jewish nation called their god Yah because of his kindnesses and El because of his strength and virtue. The Kabbalists comment on the words of King David when he says, quote, If you have seen our iniquities, Yah, O Lord, who will sustain us? Yah shows us that he is the world of mercy, Adonai, O Lord that he is the world of harshness, as it says in the Gate of Light, chapter 8. On El, you read, and it talks about how by, therefore we add El or Yah to the 72 divine, uh, so the 72 names, by adding El or Yah, you get an angel name, just like any other name. It all points back to the same reality, but through the, the diversity of the 72, all reflecting back to El or Yah. The Kabbalists, um, let me see here. The Kabbalists comment on the words of King David. Okay, okay. Um, 
On L you read in number 16, O strongest L, God of the spirits of all flesh, will your anger strike against all for the sin of one? So to us God is best because he is merciful, and greatest because he is strong. So it's showing like a duality here. And this is represented by these two divine names, Yah and El. So here it's showing that uh, Yah is more of like the merciful quality, while El is more of like the that aspect. Although many of us in like modern, like Kabbalah, we think of El as Chesed. But anyway, the thing about Kabbalah is when you look at it from different angles, it has different way of doing things. You get you get adjusted to that when you get used to doing like Kabbalistic contemplation and things. But anyways, back to the text. And if you join one of these by adding Yah or El to the 72 Kabbalistic names extracted from Exodus 14, 19 through 21, by adding El or Yah, you get the 72 Shem angel names, which it's about to list here. And if you join one of these to any of the 72 names, you will make an impressive and striking word. You must always pronounce it with the three syllables and the aspirate, written in Latin with the designation H. It must come out from the bottom of the chest as if it were a double breathing of the Latin letter H. In all cases, Yah will be pronounced just by the consonantal Y. L is the same. Both are pronounced as monosyllables, even when in a name composed of parts, and in both cases the accent falls in the same name. Um, yeah, and thank you so much, all of y'all that are now watching me right now, that are watching me live, um, because, uh, yeah, we don't have a whole lot more to go. We're almost done. So, yeah, thank y'all for watching me live. Uh, but it's about to list off the 72 Shem angels. So there are the 72 sacred names. They are, in one word, the Shem HaMeferesh that explains the Holy Tetragrammaton. They are to be spoken only by men dedicated and devoted to God, and must be pronounced thus in fear and trembling through invocations of the angels. Vehuya, Yeliel, Sitael, Elimya, Mechashia, Yelachel, Achaya, Kachetel, Haziel, Aladia, and these are the angels that we've been working through in these videos. Levia. Okay, so this is, it, it lists off the 72 Shem angels, okay? And by the way, what I like about this is it has the original Latin and, and Hebrew. It's, it's uh, pretty cool, up to 1517. So now it lists off, you know, Aniel, Rechael, Sealia, Ariel, Asalia, Michael, Vechel, Daniel. You know, it lists off uh, Imam. It lists off the different Shem angels here. Yabamia, Mumia. Okay, Tabami. Okay, gentlemen and gentlewomen, you now have access to words with which you can do more than mutter secretly to yourselves in the depths of your hearts. For now, you can express sounds aloud and in conjunction. You can summon whatever angel you like by his own symbolic name. For all the, you could summon whatever angel that you like by his own symbolic name. For although each rules over his own separate area, there is nothing they do not share. Though they live in the world above the heavens, nonetheless they care that they remain in the heaven and at the same time govern the earth. They govern the earth. So much nobler, finer, and clearer are the virtues of the higher world. As rulers, they have been given two equal tasks, to penetrate our world and themselves to be penetrated by our world. On this subject, let me make use of the comment of your Plotinus in his book on understanding and the ideas and being. He says, quote, This sensible world is located in one place only, but the intelligible world is everywhere, which is as, as if he were saying that the intelligible world walks in and orders and preserves and penetrates this world of ours that we live in. 
Now see what admirable words the Kabbalist sages have to say on this subject. Quote, there is no grass or plant below that does not have a star in the firmament that strikes it and says grow. I want to read that again. <laughs> now see what admirable words the Kabbalist so sages have to say on the subject. Quote, there is no grass or plant below that does not have a star in the firmament that strikes it and says grow. They have reached this opinion strengthened by sacred scripture, as it is written in Job chapter 38, quote, Do you know the laws of heaven if you have put a guardian or ruler or his agent on the earth? Unquote. So do not be distressed by troubles on this earth or by the cares of this lower world. For the above-named angels have been appointed to deal with them by the dispensation of the Creator. Don't worry about all the, the these angels have set to, to help us with these things. You should not think that they too belong to the nine choirs of the hierarchy above heaven. This disagrees with Athanasius Kircher because he actually divides them up in that way. For since the angel is otherness, as God is identity, and since the first otherness is being two, so we will be right to think that the number of the angels comes from a multiplication of two-ness. The cube of two, so doubling the cube, two times two times two is eight. Or the cube of two, two times two times two is eight, the first cube. If you distribute eight angels into each of the nine bands, there will be nine times eight, which is seventy-two. Return now, if you will, through the band to the cube, and through the cube to your tetractus, so we're going into sacred like numbers and stuff with the shim angels. Um, return now, if you will, through the band to the cube, and through the cube to your tetractus that we call tetragrammaton, and the Romans call quaternity. Go from that to tunus, which indicates the angelic nature, and then to the unity, God, the good and the great, also the tunus of with El and then Yah, and the pillar of fire, the pillar of water. Anyways, you will find that if we apply our study to the angels, we find that it is even through the angels that we are joined to God, the ineffable tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, and whom the first thing to shine is the noble nature of these angels. It is from the four letters yod heh vav -Hey, you posit four yods, and going down three hays, two vavs, one hay, you will soon get the sum of seventy-two which explains the ineffable and incomparable name of God, to which all sacred names lead. And again, and putting the Tetragrammaton and the Tetractus, as Athanasius would do a century later, talking about these Shem angels. There are a great number of such sacred names, but each of them is derivative except for the name of God, which is of its own kind and self-possessed. Hence it is called Mech Meyuhad. By the way, we're almost the next page and we're done. They say that these 72 are really one symbolic name because their intention is to indicate the good, great God through by many varied angelic methods, such as we mark our prince by his courtiers and the general by his army. The masters of Kabbalah greatly worship and venerate these names. By being faithful to them, men work unutterably wonderful miracles. But I will cite in this matter the very learned Rakanat, who in his commentary on Exodus 14 asserts that these characters and letters are, quote, characters flying above on the level of spiritual wisdom. They are the spirits that control or rule the doing of everything by their means. And their works are known to the Kabbalists, unquote. According to Rabbi Akiba, they came down from the throne of the glory of God. One must not be led astray by the empty superstition that all things are brought from heaven to mortals from the angels. One should rather believe that everything, even in the angels themselves, come from the majesty of God through the angels. Nebuchadnezzar bears witness in the book of Daniel when he says in Chaldaic, quote, 
and in accordance with his own will he acts upon the host of heaven and in the inhabitants of the earth." Unquote. Therefore the Kabbalists have excerpted from the book of Psalms pious prayers. Now, now it's about to go into the Psalm verses and the 72 Shem angels, okay? So now, again, this was written in 1517, early 16th century angel magic. This is about to associate the, the psalm verses with the uh, 72 angels. Um, let's see here. Zach commented, really appreciate your content, brother. Thanks for your fellowship experience. Thank you. That is such a sweet thing. Thank you, Zach. Well, I appreciate you tuning in and taking part in this video. And we've got like another page, basically. <laughs> I appreciate y'all taking part. And uh, you take, thank you. Um but now it's about each of the 72 Shem angels is associated with a psalm verse, okay? And it's found right here in De Arte Kabbalistica. So, um, watch and listen. Here is the prayer that is formed from the verses that include both Tetragrammaton and angels. Uh, ooh, where was I? <laughs> Oh, okay, therefore the Kabbalists have excerpted from the book of Psalms pious prayers addressed to God. This is where it talks about the Psalm verses with the Shem angels. Therefore the Kabbalists have excerpted from the book of Psalms, or Tehillim, pious prayers addressed to God that necessarily consist of 72 verses. Each of these verses contains the Tetragrammaton with the name of one of the 72 angels except for one relevant verse that comes at the beginning of Genesis. By these verses, they lift their minds as high as they can go towards God, and surrounded by such great praise, courageously ascend from angel to angel through these psalm verses, from angel to angel, always reaching from one to the next into the sublime, like a ladder, climbing up uh, like a ladder of lights. The angels help them in their task so that they leave secular care behind and are carried as far away as they are able to God, like light feathers wafted up by the lightest of breaths to the sublime regions of heaven, so that a feather by a mere breath may go ever higher, riding upon the wind towards heaven. Watch and listen. Here is the prayer that is formed from the verses that include both Tetragrammaton and angels. I will indicate them both to you, both with my finger and with my tone of voice, like this. Translator's note. Reuchlin gives the Hebrew and then translates into Latin. It is the Latin that is followed here. The capital letters by the side of each verse indicates the angel's name. Okay. So now, and by the way... This is from 1517. This is 16th century. I've compared a lot of the psalm verses side by side with jump forward like 300 years to 1823. Uh, Lazar Lenane's Le Sion's Couple of A lot of it's the same. Look, here, look, right here. This is 1517. So this was published in the 16th century about the Psalms. I mean, uh, well, yeah, but about the Shem angels. So check this out. Um, so we go into Agrippa in these videos, and here we're going into Roiklin. We got to do it, y'all. We got to go into these 16th century occult classics. But check it out. What does it list for Vehuya? Let We're going to do this, and then we're going to wrap it up. But check this out. So, once again, I'm going to give a link, anyone that wants to buy a copy, and uh, it helps to monetize my channel. I'll make it a monetize link, so if you do happen to buy using my link, you know, I get like a little commission. But Anyways, this is an English translation of the 16th century Latin on the art of the Kabbalah. Yeah, I know it's backwards, but check this out. We're just going to give an example. Look at this. Uh, Vehuya. It says the psalm verse, it says, And you, Lord, are the protector in my glory. You lift up my head. So that's for Vehuya. That's the psalm verse given in Johann Reuchlin's De Arte Kabbalistic in 1517. Now let's open up Lazar Lenane's Science of Kabbalah from 1823. Let's jump forward a few centuries. 
Let's see how the, the Shim Angel magic evolves over the centuries. We're going to jump forward to this more modern text. And by the way, I, I enjoy looking at a 16th century text and looking at Damon Brand or any modern Shim Angel. I like to see, like, what's going on over the centuries here? You know, what's going on? So, uh, right here in Science of the Kabbalah for Vehuya, it says the psalm verse, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. So, most of the psalm verses that is in the Science of the Kabbalah, I'll leave, get a link to this too, is found in Johann Reuchlin. So, anyways, it lists the 72 Shem Angels and then the psalm verses. That's all right here. 72 Shem Angels, 72 psalm verses, on, on, on. And then the very last paragraph that I'm going to read here. Um, now I have shown you that, uh, that there is in every line the tetragrammaton and the three letters of the angel placed either straight or in reversed order is normal. They come from the three phrases of Exodus 14, quote, and by the way, this is what it, I mean, this is what it, it says, uh, and he came and he went and he turned. Although the Romans have not yet interpreted this rightly, the Latins read the hymn as follows, as perhaps you have been able to see before in uh, Capneon's book of, on the wonderful word. So anyways, that, I hope that y'all enjoyed that. That was just, um, what we just read was Johann Reuchlin's De Arte Kabbalistica. And uh, this is uh, was published in 1517. So this is 16th century. We're going back to the sources of uh, Renaissance Shem Angel Magic. And, uh, yep, so more stuff is coming out. I really appreciate, um, you know, everyone taking part. I try to read the comp. I've been forgetting the comp, but I don't, I don't want to ever forget the comp. Let me see what this says here before I close. Okay, good results working. Uh, Zach said, I got really good results working with the second Shim Angel, Yeliel, and it formed a permanent connection. I'm, that's always great to hear. I always say, you know, a, a lot of like religious leaders and stuff, they're like, believe me. I always say, don't believe, well, me or the book or whatever that we're working through. I say, try it out, see what happens. Okay, that way... I think it's very interesting working through this material. I believe in this stuff. I've had amazing experiences. And all the time I see people commenting that they work with this stuff and they have experiences. But uh, anyway, let's see here. Max says have to go back and watch the rest of this. Yep. Um, but uh, I mean, that's why we have this here. But uh, anyways, more stuff to come, y'all. So don't forget, there's new video. There, there's videos out every day, every day, every day. There's more stuff coming out because there's so much to go through. Like we have to do this in order to work through this material. So anyways, all right, y'all. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see y'all in the next video. All right. Have a great evening, y'all. See y'all in the next